Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on Authorized Economic Operators, or AEO for short. My name is William Barnes-Graham, and I'm the Digital Content Manager at open to export We are an online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas to our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, our export action plan tool, and our quarterly competitions. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentoexport.com. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's only professional membership body for exporters, offering a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious programme of events celebrating UK businesses' exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, and you can ask questions at any point during this webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right-hand side of your screen. I'm now going to hand over to today's AEO expert, who is Holly Tonge from Vartan Consultancy, who are experts and consultants in health and safety, customs compliance, warehousing certifications, ISO standards, and of course, AEO. So over to you, Holly. Thank you, Will. Um, so, um, my name is Holly, and I represent a company called Vartan Consultancy. Um, we work predominantly with uh, businesses involved in the international supply chain. And uh, one of the main areas that we support them in is obtaining authorised economic operator status. Uh, my background is from the freight forwarding industry and having led a previous company through this process, I naturally fell into a consultancy role in this area because not many people knew how to do it at the time. We've since seen over 50 companies through this process, um, all successfully, so we have a pretty good understanding of what's involved and what you need to do to become an AEO. Okay, so um, next slide please. Right, so what is an authorised economic operator? It's a business that's involved in international trade who, after demonstrating they meet the criteria set by customs, is considered to be reliable in their operations throughout the EU. It's driven by the World Customs Organization, so it's a global thing, not an EU-specific standard, and is very much viewed as the future of international trade. Here in the EU, as we are currently a part of, there are two types of AEO status available. You can select the most suitable for your operation and apply for either or both. AOC focuses on your customs compliance. AOS is uh, called safety and security, but really that means it focuses on supply chain security aspects. There are different benefits linked to each type of status. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to give you a brief history as to where this all came from. Following the 9-11 terrorism attacks, the US government quickly identified the international supply chain as a threat to their national security. They felt the best way to address this would be to form customs business partnerships with legitimate traders, and that would release resources to focus on unknown and therefore high risk consignments. So, shortly after the 9 11 terrorist attacks, they introduced a scheme called CTPAT, which stands for Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. In 2005, the World Customs Organization, known as the WCO, adopted this as part of their safe framework of standards and has since encouraged all member countries to adopt similar schemes and make them available to traders operating within their countries. Um, the aim is to both secure and facilitate international trade. In 2008, AEO was introduced by the EU. Um, it has since been expanded and the criteria refined, most recently following the introduction of the new legislation, the UCC. By 2015, all 
WCO member countries had committed to introducing a version of AEO, many of which are now in operation. Next slide, please. So just to backtrack a moment here, I'd just like to highlight that in case you're not aware, in May 2016, Union Customs Code was introduced in the EU. This is one of the biggest changes to customs legislation seen in over 20 years. And as a result, a four year transitional period was agreed to allow customs authorities time to adopt the code and introduce the required changes. There are various milestones for different aspects, but the main one I would like to draw your attention to is that all customs authorizations will be reassessed under UCC criteria by 13. This includes obtaining customs comprehensive guarantees. Whether you hold AEO status or not, a large majority of AEO criteria will now need to be met in order to continue to use these facilities under the Union Customs Code. Just in case you're wondering what's going to happen with Brexit, uh, any transitional or implementation period under Brexit will still need to comply with the UCC legislation. Any new UK legislation customs have confirmed will be based on the UCC. This is because a lot of the legislation has to follow WCO rules anyway. And I know that the UCC is already compliant. So don't expect any major changes to some of these kind of AEO rules that are now in place. Next slide, please. Okay. So a little more on Brexit. Um, moving forward, customs will start to focus controls on supply chains that do not include AEO and are deemed to be higher risk. AEO is the best way to reduce your risk profile with customs. We don't know exactly what solutions are going to be offered by customs in regard to European trade post Brexit. What we do know is they will initially need to comply with the UCC legislation, as I just covered. Any solutions made available are likely to only be available to AEO holders. A number of companies we're working with have recently obtained AEO status as they believe it gives them the best chance of gaining access to any post Brexit facilitations. Okay, next slide, please. So, the EU is the second biggest exporter in the world. China are the largest and the US follow the EU closely in number three position. Within the EU, Germany is the biggest exporter. The UK takes second place and is closely followed by Italy. Following Brexit, UK exporters will be competing with the EU trade bloc. It is therefore worth looking at the AEO uptake across the EU to get a feel for how EU countries have responded to AEO to date. If we can move to the next slide. Great. So as you can see, although the UK is the second largest exporter in the EU, Germany, France, Italy and the Netherlands all have higher AEO uptake. Just to highlight, this database includes all companies that are eligible for AEO, which we're about to get into. So it's not just exporters. However, I see the pattern is quite clear and the UK are trailing behind a little currently. Okay, next, next slide, please. So who can apply and become an AEO? You need to be actively involved in international trade. And that's really defined in this context as the movement of goods into or out of the EU. You you also say an EORI number. That's usually your VAT number with an extra three on the end. Eligible businesses include logistics operators, carriers, and then the traditional kind of traders, importers, exporters, and manufacturers. Businesses not involved in activities directly, such as banks, consultants, and software actors, are not eligible. Business currently trading only with the EU um, should be able to apply. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, so now we're going to move into what it takes to satisfy the AO criteria and become an authorised economic operator. So this is the, um, the list of key criteria as published by Customs. Um, a history of compliance um, will go back for the previous three years. Small irregularities, one-off um, non-conformances with customs where, say, a fine could have been incurred are not going to cause you a major problem as long as you can demonstrate that adequate procedures have been put in place and established to ensure that they don't happen again. And uh, financial solvency, that's currently defined as having a good financial standing sufficient to fulfil the commitments of the applicant. Customs will only usually need to look at your uh, company's accounts in order to establish that you meet that requirement. Um, we're going to cover the rest um, in the next two slides, so if we could move on to the next slide please. As previously mentioned, um, there's two different types of AEO. This is quite unique to the EU. You. So um, the first one customs simplifications. Uh, there's certain key things that you really need to um, be on top of. Um, the most important is to have a quality management approach to customs compliance. This includes detailed documented procedures covering key aspects such as representation, classification, variation, origin, etc. I would like to highlight at this stage that if you outsource your customs activities, that's fine, but you cannot outsource your responsibilities. Um, another point to note um, for exporters is that if you're exporting on an XWorks basis, be aware that errors made on those export declarations of your goods still reflect directly onto your compliance record. So that's the sort of um, things that are covered as part of this process it gives you a good chance to fully review exactly where your liabilities are and where you could tighten on your customs compliance procedures. Practical standards of competence um, was a new criteria introduced with the UCC. Particularly in the UK, this just means you have to have a nominated person in charge of customs compliance. This person should have either at least three years experience in customs or hold a relevant qualification in the subject. Okay, next slide, please. AOS, um, term safety and security. Um, this is really looking for a risk-based approach to managing your supply chain security, which extends through to business partner management. You need risk and threat assessment and a security plan. These have to be quite comprehensive and focus on the full extent of your supply chain. So starting at um, sourcing of materials right through to delivery. Um, customs will consider your approach to verifying the identity of employees and for an appropriate level of security training to be undertaken by staff involved in um, key areas of the business. The thing about AOS is that customs will take into consideration any other security standards already held. So, for example, ports would have ISPS that would be considered, and exporters may adhere to the CAA aviation security known consumer scheme. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so benefits of AEO. Um, customs publish um, these list of benefits which are linked to um, one or other types of AEO. Um, as you can see in particular in AOC um, we've got the three at the bottom moving goods between different member states that's likely to not be available to us once we leave the EU undertaking centralised clearance, again, unlikely to be something we ever have access to. Completing self-assessment is slightly more interesting because this is something customs could use 
problems to Brexit and EU declaration because it is um, covered with current EU legislation. However, it hasn't yet been implemented in the country. Uh, benefits of AEO security really come down to having this lower risk score with customs, which reduces the frequency of checks you would see on inbound shipments into the UK and also frequency of checks when you're exporting by countries that recognise our AEO scheme. Okay, next slide please. So from experience, some of the benefits traders actually experience are a little less tangible. Um, what we do see is definitely um, the fact that you're able to reduce any customs deferment guarantees by 70% and you will definitely get your kind of uh, reductions on waivers of potential guarantees for the CCG. Um, what we, what we find, especially working with uh, importers, exporters and manufacturers, is that the AEO framework provides a really good opportunity for fully reviewing the compliance. Now, what we tend to find is that there are gaps in either procedures or knowledge or understandings and AEO allows traders to really tackle that which massively reduces the risk of potentially breaching customs rules you may have not even been aware of and incurring penalties for doing so. Um, so I would really stress that that is one of the actual main benefits of going through this process. Um, it's also becoming a very recognised global quality standard and we're also finding um, are looking to go for it because it's come up in conversations with customers um, and they feel that it's something that they now need to demonstrate. This is particularly the case for customs clearing agents we work with who are becoming more aware that they need to demonstrate that they are competent in undertaking customs clearances on behalf of then AEO importers and exporters. Uh, with regard to the safety and security, the main the main benefit really is the option of accessing mutual recognition. Um, so if you've had problems with exports getting held up at customs, say in USA, you should see a reduction in the amount of time it takes for these to be processed. doesn't mean they're not going to be examined, it just means priority should be given to them. Um, there's also these things, if you can speak to your insurance company and show that you have a supplying security status that's been fully audited um, find that a lot of clients are able to reduce their insurance premiums for example and then obviously um, it's, a, it's a good reason to look at all of your physical security and supply chain security and just make sure that there aren't extra things you need to do to reduce losses or damage etc. Okay next slide please. So Mutual recognition agreements is a quite a big topic at the moment, especially with Brexit negotiations as well. Um, at the moment, it's the EU negotiating any mutual recognition agreements on our behalf. And uh, they do that in priority of trade partners um, of the EU. So uh, USA, China and Japan were the top three, and they're the three that have been prioritised. It's only AEOS status that is recognised mutually from these other countries. And the plan is, or theory as Brexit goes, um, is that the UK and the EU will be able to mutually recognise very quickly each other's AEO status, which should again hopefully simplify trade for AEO um, supply chains. Just want to highlight here in case you've got AEO or considered going for it, um, once you get it, it doesn't mean that the destination customs authority will automatically pick up on that. I think it is the case with China, but with Japan and the USA, there's an extra step you will need to take. So for the USA, um, exporters and manufacturers are given a mid number, a manufacturer identification number, I think it is. Um, you will need to find out what your mid number is go online, add that, link it to your ERA number, and then that's the way that the US customs actually pick up that you're an AEO. 
again, with Japan, Japanese customs actually issue unique 12 digit codes against all EU AEOs and give that to the EU. So again, you need to find that code. I guess customs would be the best place to, to get that from and make sure that you're providing that code to your clients in Japan so that they can put it on the customs entry and again, make that connection that you're authorized economic operator and therefore that shipment should be given priority treatment. So that's a key thing to understand. Currently also um, negotiations are underway with Canada. So that should be an extra mutual recognition coming into place shortly. Okay, next slide, please. So if you're wondering how you actually get AEO status, um, the application forms are available online. You can just Google AEO application and it will be the top hit. Um, the application consists of two forms. There's the C117, which is a basic two page application form about your business. And then there's a C118 self-assessment form, which needs to be submitted alongside the C117. The self-assessment is about 16 pages long um, and goes into detail and really walks you through the criteria of what they're actually expecting you to have in place um, in order to become an AEO. Again, what's important here is to look at these forms alongside the explanatory notes that accompany them to get a full understanding of when you tick a box to say, yes, you have that, what customs actually expect to see in place. Um, so I would recommend your first point of call is to have a look at these forms, see if you feel that you meet the criteria. Usually you would identify a number of areas that would need to be addressed, be it documenting some procedures or Maybe you decide to put CCTV up because you're concerned that your storage facility is not secure enough. And once you once you feel confident that you meet the majority of the criteria, you can then look to submit the application. Next slide, please. So the application and approval process. Um, you complete the forms. You're going to attach certain key supporting documents with them as well. Um, this is high level kind of information that they specifically request within the C118 form, such as site plans, audited accounts. Um, they don't need to see all of your policies and procedures because that's what they verify at a later stage. So you submit that usually by email to a central site. They'll acknowledge initial acceptance and complete some initial checks just to make sure the key information's there and matches their systems. Then they'll give it a bit of a more thorough read through. So usually that takes kind of three to four weeks maximum. Um, and then they'll submit um, a letter to you confirming their formal acceptance of the application. This then starts a 120 day decision on their part. Um, it's 120 days if they're just looking at UK operations. If your operation expands throughout Europe, they'll add an extra 60 days to it because they'll have to get the respective customs authorities in Europe to check out the operations in their countries. Um, so that 120 day period begins. Customs will decide how often and how many visits or sites they need to visit um, quite early on and will complete. Sometimes it's one or two, sometimes it's five or six. Depends on the type and the scale of the operation, how different sites are that are involved in the international supply chain, etc. Um, providing you meet the criteria, you'll then receive your authorization around the 100 day point. I would also like to highlight here, as long as the bulk of the criteria um, then customs will work with you through the period. So if they find that there's a couple of things that they would like to see improved or addressed, you will have a chance to do that during that 120 day period. They will then come back, check it's in place and you move forward with your application. And next slide, please. So is AEO the right decision for you? Each business is very different. And um, 
only really you can decide. What I would recommend is you identify the perceived benefits for your operation versus the resources you have in place required to obtain it. By reading the relevant published information and especially in the current climate monitoring changes to government policies over the next few months, um, you should then be able to be in a better position to make that decision. Um, it also comes down to the reasons that you're considering it in the first place. Um, a lot of safe forwarders and aging it because they fear that they will be cut out of secure supply chains if they don't. Um, for exporters, a lot is concerns over lengthy border processes, especially the US at the moment. Um, if you're also looking to apply for any customs facilitations, authorizations, so those sort of things are outward processing, inward processing, carriage, customs warehousing, um, then you're going to be in a better position if you've got AEO um, than if you're starting from scratch. It will just make the process easier. You don't have to have AEO in order to go for these things, but because you have to meet so much of the AO criteria, um, it will then make the secondary stage of obtaining these authorizations a lot easier. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I just wanted to highlight at this stage a couple of further resources from the EU. Um, there's an EU web page which you can search for any AEOs. They have to consent to being published on this database, but from experience, most companies tick that box quite happily. Um, and so if you're wondering if any of your current agents or um, forwarders hold AEO, I'd recommend you kind of look up this site and um, pop their name in and see. It's, it's very good. And if you're considering maybe appointing a new clearing agent, um, again, it might be worth looking for one that holds AEOC status because you know that they've gone through this process and have procedures in place to ensure that your directions are completed in a compliant fashion. Um, the EU have also, just in the last few days, um, published a AEO ebook, which is um, it's a kind of learning tool, um, digital training and work resources is, is what they call it. Um, so that would be worth accessing as well, especially as an internal training and educational resource. It also covers a bit of a background as to why customs authorities are really behind this AEO approach. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that brings us to the end of uh, the main content of the presentation, which I hope has been helpful to you. These are my contact details. So if you have any specific questions or do require support in this process, you've hit a stumbling block, please feel free to get in touch. Okay, then I think we have some questions. Yes, many thanks, Holly. That was a really great introduction to AEO there. And um, as Holly mentioned, we're now going to open the floor for questions. So please do ask questions using the control panel to the right hand side of the screen. Um, first question is just um, from Richard. And he's asked, in terms of self-assessment declarations, um, he's asked, will they come in and how will they work? And he's a company who's been AEO approved for a couple of years, but it's never been mentioned to them. So he's curious to know a little bit more about self-assessment. Right, okay. Um, at the moment, we don't know, to be honest. Um, it's something that we're monitoring with customs and hoping that it's something that will be pushed forward as a facilitation for Brexit. But until they make a decision, um, I'm afraid I don't have any further information for you. No worries. Um, it's always good to know what you don't know, I suppose, as well. And <laughs> um, a question we had in advance, actually, from Kathleen is just a bit more about the CPAT certification and how is AEO similar to it? OK, so AOS, uh, so the safety and security side of it, is the equivalent to the American CTPAT scheme. So they're the same, they just go under different names. 
what you find is um because the World Customs Organization kind of term this approach AEO, a lot of countries call their scheme as AEO, but not all of them. The Chinese one has a slightly different name as well. Can't remember what it is right now. <laughs> okay, okay. And the, a couple of questions from Tim. Uh, he's asked, first of all, is there a cost of submitting the AEO application and how much? And then also ask, once AEO status is obtained, how long is it valid for and what is the revalidation process? Yeah, great questions, actually. Apologies if I didn't cover them. Um, it's actually free um, to apply and submit and the whole customs auditing process is at no cost um, to the applicant. The only cost comes in if companies decide they need extra support and hire consultants. but you can do it at no cost at all. Um, with regard to the status, um, you basically hold it unless it's taken away from you for any reason. Um, what you do find is there is a three year reassessment period where customs should come out and audit you, make sure you're still compliant. Um, what we find is that this is maybe slightly more sporadic in practice. So they might come after two, then you might and was for five. Um, it's a bit hit and miss, but there is a regular reassessment period um, where a customs officer will come come back and check you out. Also, um, you are reassessed if there's a major change to your business. So if you moved to a new location, for example, they may send someone out to reassess the security side of things. Um, there's a once you once you obtain AO status, there's some key information that you have to update customs if it changes, and then that will either trigger a reassessment or it will be based on the nature of the change. Thank you, Holly. And um, a question from Michael is, is AEO aimed at businesses completing document clearance in-house as opposed, as opposed to ones that use freight forwarders? Right, okay, yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, it's aimed at any businesses um, involved in customs, so regardless of who is completing the actual declaration, um, the, the company completing it can go for AEO, the company contracting the completion can go for AEO. What is really, again, crucial to highlight here is that you can be using a customs clearing agent but really what you're asking them to do is to transmit a legal declaration on your behalf you can't pass on that liability and therefore you should have appropriate measures in place to actually verify the accuracy of the declarations they're completing on your behalf it's also your responsibility to hold on to copies of those declarations for i think it's years now um, so make sure that those agents are sending copies of the sad form and the associated prints with exports uh, you get an s8 once the goods have actually left the eu and that's really your proof of export it's one of the most vital pieces of customs documentation that exporters can hold on to with imports it's a c88 and an e2 that you want to be looking for um, so again, the AO process is very useful to actually highlight um, these responsibilities, even if certain activities are outsourced. Great, thank you. And um, yeah, we're getting quite a lot of questions in actually. So yeah, I'll try and get to as many of these as possible. Um, <laughs> just back to the mid number and the 12 digit code for Japan. Um, so we've had a couple yep. of questions just asking for a bit more clarification on this. And I guess okay. one of the key bits is A, where, where do you find out about um, what, what yep. your numbers and codes are? And then where do you put the numbers and codes again? Okay, so uh, with, I'll answer the latter part first. Um, so whoever is doing the import declaration at the destination country, it would be that person that's putting the codes in the correct places on the import declarations in America and Japan. In order to find out the codes, um, for the American CTPAT mid code, 
whoever you're sending your shipments to should be able to tell you what your mid number is. Um, it's probably already been assigned if you're sending things out there um, and you're just not aware of it. Um, there's some information on the EU uh, website with like uh, FAQs about this. So I would recommend people have a look on there um, for a bit more information. It's not something we're directly involved in, it's just something we're very aware often gets missed once people hold AEO status. Um, the same with the Japanese, I know that the EU hold a list of any AEOs with these numbers assigned. Um, again, there's FAQs on the EU website, so that should point you in the direction of where to actually get that number. Great, thank you. And we've had a question in from Bill, um, and he asks if a UK importer is currently registered in another EU member country and has AEO certification there, would it be recognised by the UK post Brexit? Again, that comes down to Brexit's trade negotiations with the EU. We hope that that will be the case, and it's definitely the direction that customers are pushing. But until the agreement is in black and white, I can't confirm for sure. Great, thank you. And yeah, I think that will probably answer a couple of the other Brexit questions we've, we've had coming in. Is that it's, it's, it's all a topic for the negotiations. Yeah. Um, and a question we've had in from Gary then is, if you have used freight forwarders to date or shipped to the EU, would you have to wait three years to apply for AEO status or can you use your freight forwarder data? Sorry, could you ask that again? So, yeah, if you have freight forwarders to date, or if you've used freight forwarders to date or shipped to the EU, would you have to wait three years to apply for AEO status, or can you use um, the, the freight forwarders that you've used so far, I think? Right, okay. Assuming the question is in relation to if you're maybe not using AEO uh, forwarders, uh, um, yeah, then no problem at all. Um, what you don't have to use AEO forwarders. Um, it makes things easier, but you can also have uh, security kind of specifications or contracts in place with them, highlighting exactly how you wish for your shipments to be handled, and that would be accepted by customs as security management of those suppliers. Um, you don't need to be involved in international trade for the last three years to apply. So don't see any any reason to say no. <laughs> okay, okay. And um, a question from Lara is, if you have an approved export number, does this go towards AEO criteria? And the question I was going to ask as well, you mentioned that the bulk, or if, if um, customers can see the bulk of the criteria is matched, um, then they will kind of try to go ahead with the application. And the question I was going to ask was, what are the key kind of criteria that are absolutely necessary to be obliged for a customer to even consider it? So that's, that's two questions there. One about the approved export to number and the other about the main criteria for customs. Okay. Um, approved for the status. Um, the only one I'm aware of is um, in relation to kind of postal movements, I think. Um, but all I can suggest is that they have a look at the actual C118 and explanatory note criteria and cross-reference what they what their approved exporter number covers and then what AEO covers. I suspect that there would be a lot of extra criteria to be met in order to obtain the AEO. Um, what was your question again, sorry? In terms of the the bulk of the criteria, which customs, if right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there, I mean, I'm saying, really, you need to be meeting kind of ninety percent of what they're expecting. Um, what will happen is they'll come out. And when you go through the C118, there's certain questions. Do you have a risk and threat assessment? Yes or no. Do you have a security plan? Yes or no. What we found is traditionally people would kind of tick yes. Just I've got a plan, it's in my head, no problem. Um, actually, if you're not producing a document of that title to customs, then that's the point where you start running into problems. What 
you'll be okay with is maybe if that plan isn't comprehensive enough, um, but they can see that you've made an effort to address that criteria, they'll then say, okay, it's fine, but you've forgotten all about your external partners or outsourced warehousing, so please include that. Um, there are certain things that are a little borderline, like a parking policy if you're in a shared premises, um, but on the most part, you kind of need to address every single question. Um, so, yeah, in a way, it's all key, I'm afraid. <laughs> No worries, that's good, that's good to know. And um, if I had an interesting question from Darren, and it's kind of aside from the countries you listed, do you know of any other countries um, who are looking to adopt AEO or, or form of AEO status? Right, yeah. So actually, there's a huge amount of countries with AEO, and they just don't currently have negotiated mutual recognitions with the EU. Um, so, like UAE, Brazil, um, I think Vietnam, Thailand, and Philippines, like loads. Australia have one, New Zealand, even Rwanda has one. But again, it's probably not up to the standard that would be recognised on a uh, international kind of recognition one. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot out there, and there's a lot of mutual recognition between countries that I haven't mentioned. Um, so for example, I think China and Japan have more um, than just the EU. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, there's a lot out there. <laughs> and there will eventually be all, all countries that are WCO members will have a version of this scheme in place. Great, so that's good to know. And um, a question from Carol, which is, uh, I guess asking for uh, even more info, which is if a company such as ours who already has customs warehouse approval and it, and export primarily to Europe or European zones, can you suggest any other advantages not already covered during your presentation? Okay, so um, they may have received a letter recently about their customs warehousing authorization. Uh, reassessment under UCC and what they'll probably find is that whether they've gone down the CCG line or not the whole process would be easier if they had AO status and again depending on what comes out of solutions proposed for Brexit uh, if they're predominantly dealing with EU then it may be that it's available to AOs that make that process uh, easier um, after we leave the EU again don't know for sure at the moment great thank you and um a, a question which i think you you will probably have already answered but is it's from neil and he asks kind of what are the benefits are there any benefits for a service company looking at at aao is this just completely for goods right yeah um it's really it's based on the physical movement of goods across international supply chains so i don't think that there would be even i don't i don't think a service company could even meet the criteria to apply because they're not involved in the international trade of goods as such Thank you. Yeah, always good to to clarify the service and goods yeah. kind of distinction. Um, and then another interesting question, is, is which you kind of touched upon, but I think it's it's a good one to to kind of re ask a little bit, is okay. considering how much work can be involved in completing an assessment, and considering a lot of our audience are SMEs. Yeah. When is it worth the time and effort, and and what are the gains for particularly smaller businesses? Yeah, so um, I mean, I guess this one isn't too easy to answer because it, it all depends on their unique setup, who their clients are, where they're based, what their future plans are. If if they're an SME that are just sending out a few exports and not experiencing major issues with getting them through destination customs, the benefits may be minimal. Um, if they're looking at kind of Brexit and debating getting into customs warehouse operation or temporary storage facilities, for example, then this would be a natural path to follow to prepare for that. So um, it, it really does come down to um, 
the individual kind of researching and understanding exactly what they want out of the process. Again, a lot of people go for things like quality standards like ISO. Um, some companies are preferring to use this custom specific um, standard to plug that gap. So if you see it as a much broader approach to your kind of internal compliance and mapping procedures and things, then you could do it as part of this and just to happen to obtain a year at the end. Um, but it does take time. Typically, it takes kind of three to six months for companies to prepare, but it can take a lot longer depending on what internal resource they have and how quickly they want to approach certain things. Um, so it is definitely something that needs to be seriously considered before you launch into it. Great. And um, yeah, we've just got a couple more questions. The uh, questions are starting to, to slow. Um, and this is from Phil, and it's just kind of, what is the current rating list to undergo the initial AEO certification? Rating list? Yes. Um, I don't, there isn't one published. Um, do you mean like a um, kind of pass mark type thing? I think it'd be more kind of how long would it take to kind of um, Oh, sorry, waiting list. <laughs> I misheard that. I so um, basically, um, the EU legislation says that upon formal acceptance, customs have to make a decision within 120 days. So they don't have much option but to stick to that time frame. Um, so despite the number of applications may go up in the next few months um, as we approach 2019, there shouldn't be an increase in time in processing those applications. Great, many thanks, and uh, no worries about the, uh, the misunderstanding <laughs> on the, I think it's eroticism, I think it's the, the R's and W's. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a, a couple of questions which might, there, there might be a, a no comment answer to, to okay. them, but um, so I'm going to ask this in two parts. The first part is, um, is it true that retaining e AEO can actually be more difficult than obtaining it sometimes? And then a the second part, is do you think offers officers authorizing or auditing AU applications have different working criteria and therefore the playing field isn't always necessarily level i.e a heavy touch versus a light touch from different officers that might be the one you do a no comment for but um anywho. <laughs> okay um so the first one um i understand why this has been asked because if you went for AU in 2008 it was a matter of kind of filling in a form. And I think at some point, customs didn't even complete on-site audits all of the time. You kind of just got it. Um, then they obviously improved their approach um, or made it more thorough at least. Um, then when the kicked in in 2016, a lot of additional criteria was added and definitely there was a complete change in the approach. What we found was a lot of people that had sailed through initial AEO authorization suddenly had to kind of jump through hoops in order to get through their reassessment. Um, that's probably going to continue to happen, especially over the next few years. Um, once we break from the EU, the UK Customs can add or take from this uh, criteria as much as they like. Um, I imagine they'd be more on the side of adding rather than taking from it. So again, you may find that there's extra measures to be met. Um, but it's usually addressed within one to two days, we find, you know, even if there's extra things, it's usually just a missing documentation um, that needs to be put in place, an extra policy here, an extra procedure there, and it's covered. So um, I wouldn't say that it's harder to retain it, but it, there definitely have been changes in the bar that needs to be met in order to hold it. Um, with regard to the officers, I mean, it's hard to comment exactly um, because we don't have access to the approach that they should follow. Um, so we do witness um, on occasion some businesses have definitely an increased number of visits or what we would deem to be more thorough audits. But whether that's driven by some flags that were 
raised during central site checking or kind of compliance monitoring throughout the system, we're not privy to that information. So um, hard to comment exactly, but I will agree that if you look at a like for like business, we do see a difference in um, the approaches between different officers. Cool, thank you. And I'm um, going to do just maybe one or two more questions as we're, we're hitting the, the, the time soon. Um, but this is a question from Becky, and it's um, she notes that a requirement of the application is proving the people carrying out the import and exporting are sufficiently trained. And she asks, kind of, are there any courses which can prove this? Yeah, definitely. There's, an, there's a number of courses available. Um, there's some with the Institute of Export, um, there's some with other trade bodies. Um, it doesn't have to be too in depth either, um, as long as you can demonstrate understanding in the areas of customs compliance, which really come down to customs classification of your tariff codes, meeting the rules of origin of goods and understanding the basics of what they entail um, and the customs valuation which is not always as straightforward as just taking the value of the commercial invoice um, so understanding those to sufficient detail and knowing what you're looking for on a customs declaration um, is the kind of base level of knowledge um, that we would expect to find in operators in imports and exports Great. And um, I guess one last question is, with obviously Brexit coming up and AEO gaining more publicity, um, mm -hmm. do you think HMRC are going to be able to deal with the, the upsurge, the upswing in demand? Again, this is a, this funny one where they have no choice because they are legally required to make those decisions for the 120 days. So I guess they'll see an increase and they'll just have to put more officers onto it. Um, we've definitely seen um, a change in the officers coming out. Um, you know, they're kind of new to AEO, so there's definitely more being trained up to come out and complete the audit. So I guess part of that is customs addressing the increase in applications. Great. Well, um, on that note, I think we're going to wrap up for now. Uh, thank you so much, Holly, for a really great kind of introduction um, to the, what's a really interesting topic and um, one which I'm sure we'll get even more publicity in the coming years. And thank you as well for a really lively Q&A, um, both, both Holly for answering and everyone in the audience for asking. Um, we will certainly try and get to some of these offline afterwards as well. So, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. And um, thank you, Holly, once again. You're welcome. Before heading off, I'd like to just draw your attention to a couple of things with the Institute. First of all, following what was a, a really fascinating summit in Newcastle earlier this week, our regional trade summits move on to Edinburgh next for the Scotland summit on April 25th. If you're based in or near Scotland, I definitely recommend coming along. Uh, there's going to be some excellent networking opportunities and some cutting edge thought leadership and practical tips around the kind of biggest issues and challenges in international trade. So do definitely come along to that. On the Epin to Export side of things, the Export Action Plan competition is open again for entries. The final for the eighth competition is taking place in London at the Trade and Export Finance Conference on June 7th. And once again, the competition is a great opportunity for SMEs from all sectors and parts of the country to win £3,000 cash towards their export plans and further prizes. More info about that is on our website and the deadline for entry this time is May the 4th. In April, we're running three webinars around risk in export, starting with a session with Bibi Financial Services on financial risk on April 12th. And we will be returning to the topics of corruption and intellectual property later on in the month. So you can find sign up details for all of our future webinars and recordings to our previous ones at opentoexport.com forward slash webinars. And for those asking about a recording of today's webinar, go to that URL uh, this time tomorrow and you will find a recording of today's session there. And 
As always, please do take our exit survey to let us know what you thought about today's webinar and to give us any suggestions for improvements or future topics. Many thanks everyone and have a great rest of the week. Goodbye.